Hello, Plant Strong Gang. Greetings from Austin, Texas, which I can say has been my home now for almost 38 years. I, I can't even believe it. I hope that you're feeling good today, and at least as good as can be expected anyway. Thanks for tuning in this week to the Plant Strong Podcast. Today, before we launch in with Dan Butner, I have a special invitation for each of you. As the country slowly begins to emerge from quarantine, now is the time to do all that we can to optimize our health and shore up our defenses from the inside out. I invite you to join us for our first ever Plant Strong Primer, a live weekend event with the whole Esselstyn family. This family learning lab is all online and will take place from Friday, May 15th to Sunday, May 17th, 2020. So I'd encourage you to gather up your family and join ours for this interactive weekend of lectures, make along cooking demos, and a primer into all things plants. It's perfect for beginners and for people needing a reset. We know that whole food plant-based nutrition has the irrefutable power to help people lose weight, drop blood pressure, lower cholesterol, and fight back against type 2 diabetes and heart disease. We also know that almost 97% of those hospitalized for COVID-19 had one or more of these comorbidities. As my father likes to say, these diseases are toothless paper tigers that need never exist. And if they do exist, they need not progress. Let us help you take control of your health destiny. Please know that events like this help fund the work that we do all year long, from producing the Plant Strong podcast and to creating recipes and an endless stream of inspirational content. It also funds big projects like our Heart of the Hero campaign for first responders in the city of Pittsburgh. Your ticket purchase for this exclusive weekend is a vote for this kind of work to continue. And in our efforts to give back, Partial proceeds will benefit the Esselstyn Foundation, a 501c3 public charity currently providing plant-strong meals to healthcare workers on the front lines of COVID-19. So again, I invite you to gather up your family and join ours from May 15th to the 17th. We'll serve up the science along with inspiration and practical application, everything that you need to begin or to maintain your plant-strong lifestyle. Visit primer.plantstrong.com today and register. That's primer.plantstrong.com. Imagine taking this time during the COVID pandemic to implement life lessons from the blue zones, those tenants that promote a longer and healthier life, inspired by the people around the world who actually live the longest. And the best part, we can do it right now in our own homes. Ideas like developing connections, moving more naturally, slowing down, putting your family first, finding a a sense of belonging, and of course, adopting a a whole food, plant-strong diet. As my guest today, Dan Butner says, it's the best thing for our health, our country, and all the creatures that inhabit it. Dan, as many of you know, is the wildly acclaimed, best-selling author of the Blue Zone books. As a journalist and researcher for National Geographic, he discovered the five places in the world dubbed Blue Zones, where people live the longest, healthiest lives. Today, I talk with Dan through his Power Nine, those nine mutually supporting characteristics that these Blue Zone areas have in common to promote health, happiness, and longevity. I encourage you to explore ways to adopt and implement as many of these as possible into your own lives, especially now, this very second, when the entire planet is on the precipice of radical change. We can use these crazy times for our own good and the good of the world. It starts now and it starts with you. Enjoy this talk with Dan Butner. Dan Butner, I want to welcome you to the Plant Strong Podcast. Uh, I want to say that 
I miss you. The last time I saw you wasn't, uh, God, I think it was back in August of 2019 at Plantstock. You blessed us with your presence Friday night, one of the, our great keynote speakers. You brought down the house. Um, Those were back in the days where you could hug each other and, <laughs> and, you know, eat at the same table with other humans. Yeah. And we did a lot of that. <laughs> Speaking of which, how, how have you been doing with this whole COVID-19? I mean, I would think as a, as a world traveler and a guy that, you know, got on airplanes a whole bunch and saw a lot of different cultures, this is either a really great reprieve for you or it's really hard. It's a former. I, this is the first time in over 15 years I've slept in the same bed for 15, more than 30 consecutive days. And so I, I'm loving it, actually. I've, I have decided, you know, I, I don't want to be tone deaf. I know a lot of people are suffering out there and losing their jobs, et cetera. But uh, I've just chosen to make it a time of, of basically rebooting and a healthy time, a time to cook and read laterally from what I read all the time and get eight hours of sleep and do yoga and meditate and, and, um, and call, you know, friends like Rip Elsestan. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, I, I, I like that. And, uh, you know, you are the eternal optimist. And I think that's one of the things that, uh, that everybody who knows you loves about you. Um, so as I, as I introduced you at plant stock, I want to kind of start in that vein a little bit. Um, you know, in some of the circles that we travel in, you are considered the most interesting man uh, <laughs> in the world. You're like a combination of Peterman from, from Seinfeld and the Dos Equis guys, the Dos Equis guy, who's the most interesting, you know, man on the, in the world. Um, but I'm on the way with the gray hair. I just got to grow the beard. <laughs> you, you, you do. And I need to be flanked by two beautiful women. And then, uh, then I'm there. I th well, you're flanked by one beautiful woman. I'm flanked, yeah, sure. she's not flanking at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, Dan, you're an explorer, you're an author, you're an educator, a producer, a storyteller, a public speaker, world record holder when it comes to cycling, entrepreneur. I mean, that's, that's pretty, pretty crazy stuff. And when we, we had dinner uh, before Plant Stock and Matthew McConaughey was there, he also said, that you were so interesting that he wanted to chase you down, get to know you, and that he had a man crush on you. Now, I mean, that's, that's pretty cool stuff. Yeah, I forgot all about that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good, that's good. So let, let me ask you this, Dan, because um, you've done a lot of amazing stuff, and I wanna get into a couple of those things right now with you. First, you've got three world records uh, riding that bicycle back, I think, God, it was probably the 90s and the early 200s, 2000s. Uh, you did America's track, you did Soviet track, Africa track. Um, what in the world, why were you, why were you doing that? I mean, 12,000, 15,000 miles over six months. What was that all about? Well, the, the, I mean, the earliest in Paul, I remember sitting in church and seeing a, like the State Farm insurance salesman sitting in the front pew with his family perfect. And I said to myself, that's not going to be me. And I think the manifestation of it when I graduated with, from college was to, to uh, get away in a big way. I come from Minnesota, which has the highest per capita uh, number of explorers uh, than any place else in the world. Uh, mm -hmm. Will Steger, who first got to the North Pole, um, Eric Severide, famous explorer, paddled with the Cree, Paul Shirky, and Bancroft, probably the most famous female explorer in all time. So those were the people I ran with when I was young. And my manifestation of exploration was biking Alaska to Argentina. I actually did in the 80s, 86, 87. Uh, biked around the world through the Soviet Union in the 90s. I called my ride from Minneapolis to St. Paul the long way, and then across <laughs> Africa, uh, which is the hardest, biking across the Sahara Desert, um, 1200 miles across the Congo to the southern tip. Um, you know, and like most things in life, the most difficult things you do are the most rewarding. And, and they were far and away, both, um, I would say, physically and logistically and, and, and uh, psychologically, the most difficult things I've ever done. But they're, they're great bases to go on for a life of, of, um, of exploration. And also, by the way, people say, hey, go high five for making those world records. The, the real value, I think, comes from the empathy that you learn when you're on a bike and you're going through, 
you know, the worst of the third world countries, uh, you can't help but uh, feel their, their um, struggle and internalize it some and, and come back with, I think, a feeling like you, like you should be sharing what you have and also uh, um, a, a, a mode of counting your blessings, which, which, I, which I do every day. Yeah. And so you said of, the, of those three treks that you did, which was the hardest one? Was it the, was it the Soviet trek, looking back on it? Soviet trek had a really hard part. So, so to get across the Soviet Union, there's an 800-mile stretch from Chita to Blagovations. And um, you, there are the, you, for the most part, we paralleled the um, Trans-Siberian Railway. But there are three mile-long tunnels that um, you, they're so narrow that if you're caught, if you're, if you're in there at the same time that a train is, you don't come out alive. And there was a very, you know, we thought, well, we could do it. It would take us 20 minutes to get through it, but there was no way to time the trains back then. So, you know, there was probably a, you know, only one in 75 chance that we would be there when the train, but if that, if you, if the, you know, that Russian roulette, your, your, your life's over. So we did it. We pushed our bikes 800 miles through mud and through a bog. It took a month. I lived off, this is pre plant-based days. I lived off of, uh, of, course, of course, the only thing you get your hands on, I lived off a of, uh, pig fat and buckwheat porridge for 28 days and um, constantly wet, constantly exhausted, constantly cold. That was, that was hard. But Africa, getting across the Sahara Desert, you know, you're biking through sand, your bike weighs 100 pounds. It's like pushing, the analogy I use is like pushing a, a a grocery cart full of watermelons down a beach, you know, for 18 days. Oh. And, um, you know, you're hot, you're full of sand and you're sick and, and uh, food's hard to come by and you're scared as hell. You're not gonna be able to find water. And, um, you know, we saw a human road kill. We crossed the Congo, a uh, um, country that half the size of the continent of the United States, no roads and every river you had to fort, you had to put your bike up on your shoulders and walk across. So, I mean, they, I, of course there's a lot of joy. There's a lot of wonderful days when you're seeing things that no other human sees, but on, on the other hand, it was, it was a character builder. And how, and you did these with how many other people? Each, in each case, it was, three others or four of us, my brother, Steve was on uh, part of, was on the last two. And it was always a mechanic guy who could fix anything, a languages per person and um, a doctor. We somehow magically recruited a physician every time who also happened to want to bike across the continent. And then me, who was the orchestrator. <laughs> so you had, you know, it was, it was like the fantastic four in a way. So we all had our own skills that, we, we could call on in times of need. Uh, across Africa, Chip Thomas, Dr. Chip Thomas, very famous photographer, physician, uh, was on the team. Uh, he lives in Arizona today, but um, uh, African-American, and we had an African, so it was two blacks and two whites, and he was making a point about racial cooperation. And then around mm -hmm. the world, it was uh, with two Soviet communists, one of whom was from the KGB, I discovered later. <laughs> and... Uh, um, so we were making a point about cooperation at, at the very end of the Cold War. And, um, and so they, you know, they, they're multi-purpose expeditions. Wow. You know, so when I was talking to you at Plant Stock, I asked you, like, what was your, what was the biggest takeaway from all of these adventures that you've, you've had? And I don't know if you remember your answer, but I'll share it with you. And then I'd love for you to like expound on it just a little bit. But you said, you know, Rip, I really developed a irreverence for the word no. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm I, in I an I can hide my own Easter egg. That sounds brilliant, doesn't sound, <laughs> but I don't remember saying it. But yes, I, yes, that's true. I mean, yeah, uh, it's well put. That, because... You know, you have you have these uh, big ideas of doing these long bike rides, and and um, we needed sponsors. I remember I I wrote over seven hundred letters. This is back in the day when you wrote on paper and folded yeah. it in an envelope and put a stamp on it with an address uh, and mailed it. 
uh, we had wrote over 700 hundred uh, letters looking for sponsors for tents and bikes and so forth. And, you know, either didn't hear from them or, or um, 98% of were no's. And I had this huge file folder of no's that was as big as a telephone book. And, you know, I always said that was, that was the key to my success to be able to hear no or no, 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 no. And just, you know, not hear it. <laughs> yeah yeah just keep plowing forward well you know and, and i have an uncle he um he's the guy that wrote charlie wilson's war uh, he was a producer for cbs and he said what he loved about no is it me it meant that he was one step closer to yes <laughs> that's well put so let me let me talk to you dan about uh the blue zones because obviously that's the the thing that um you have been you know head Head, head and shoulders and feet and everything into for the last, God, I would say probably close to, uh, what, 15, 16 years? That, yes. that brand has, has been your brand. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the, like the Blue Zones? I mean, I know it's the longest, you went in search of the longest living people on the planet and you came back with five, right? Is that easy? Uh, it started out at five. It started out, it, it was three. It was originally in 1999, actually. So that's over 20 years ago. I'd done an expedition to Okinawa uh, on some research I found from the World Health Organization that showed that Okinawa had the longest disability-free life expectancy in the world and um, did just a real facile expedition there. I got interested in it and came back and uh, a, appealed to the National Institutes on Aging and National Geographic for a trip that would set out or a project that would set out to find all of the areas that live where people live statistically longest. And the hard part about that two and a half years was just finding these places and vetting them because there's so much misinformation and myth around longevity around the world. And then uh, once you once we found those places, uh, set out to reverse engineer uh, what they did or longevity, what they did to, you know, live so long and national geographic ultimately gave me a big, uh, year long assignment. And, um, uh, we found, uh, or I found, uh, or, or identified blue zones in, in, uh, first Sardinia. That was probably the best established Okinawa. And then among the seventh day Adventist and wrote a cover story for national geographic and a book and the book did well. I took the proceeds with the books and hired the, at, the the demographers to go out to look for more blue zones. And we found a fourth one in the Nicoya Peninsula of Costa Rica and a fifth one on the island of Ikaria in Greece, just off the coast of Turkey in the Aegean Sea. And so uh, how much time did it take for, for you to discover these five? A couple of years? You and no, your team? No, it took four years. Four, five okay. Years, five yep. years to, to identify all five. It's hard to say that I discovered them because these people have been around for a long time. <laughs> yeah. But, but no, I did the re my I I I led the research. You know, I had a bunch of other very capable scientists on my team that did the math, the demography, and um, so I led the team that I, I identified all five as statistically longest lived. Yeah. Um, do you, in your opinion, do you think there's any other blue zones that are out there? Maybe one or two. Yeah. Probably the uh, glo globalization and uh, the American food culture is, is uh, infecting in all of these places. So a blue zone, essentially, what you get is an extraordinary a sweet spot between a place that benefits first of all from public health you know these you don't you you don't see a blue zone in Sierra Leone you know or Haiti um, um, where there's stratospheric rates of infectious disease and 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 and, and hunger and so forth um, these places all benefit from public health in many cases better than we have here in the United States uh, but on top of that they have a culture that has you know, I argue that there's been some kind of uh, natural selection, societal natural selection, where they've they've um, they've 
progressively adopted things that have favor well-being and, and longevity and health and let other things go. Um, so you got you have a culture, a tradition, uh, a very healthy tradition on top of good public health. And that's, that's what's produced these blue zones. Hmm. They don't hmm. have superior genes. Only about 20% of how long you live is dictated by genes. 80% is everything else. So these, these are all, with the exception of part of Sardinia, they're all melting pots of different ethnicities. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you this. So then of the, of the five blue zones, and you know how I remember it, my acronym is LIONS. So, you know, Loma Linda, Icaria. Oh, uh, I didn't even know yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. O Okinawa, Nicoya, and then Sardinia, Lions. Thank you. Um, <laughs> how, many, how many of those since you discovered or since you guys Identify them. Found, identified them, thank you, uh, would you say are still considered blue zones? All of them? Well, they all, them? they all, you know, market their designation, but... Okinawa is probably not a blue zone anymore. I mean, there are blue zone characteristics to bring to life, but they're they're one of the least healthy pre pre prefixtures in Japan. And uh, I, I'd say uh, it, Nicoya is not far behind. Nicoya is a half a generation uh, away from also losing it. You know, they, and I mean, they did the same thing we did in America. We, we developed a taste for chips and sodas and, yeah. you know, fried chicken and, and uh, we want a car and then a second car and a bigger house and air conditioning. And, you know, you stop, stop going out your porch uh, to cool off after dinner. So you stop socializing and um, American led lifestyle is corroding. Well, to me, one of the things that's so interesting, especially considering where we are right now, you know, with, with COVID-19 and, um, and how it's really um, identified, all, I think, all of our shortcomings, right? And it's almost this Dar Darwinian attack uh, on us as a, as a, as a culture. Um, I think that there's never been a better time for, for all of the cities in America to become blue zones. Um, yeah, you know, our, our hair is on fire with this COVID-19 when we have 50,000 people who've died in America now. Yeah. Or a terrible tragedy, but uh, 9 million will die of a chronic disease. And that's where the house is on fire. And by the way, most of the COVID-19 have a comorbidity of diabetes or some heart disease or... 95%. 90? I, yeah, I thought it was, I knew it was at least 90. So... Yeah. Um, the, the same things that are causing heart attacks and, and diabetes and foreshortening our lives um, in the, in the non-infectious realm are, are, are killing us in the infection realm. So the, I, the lessons that people in the blue zones, and by the way, the best way to think about blue zones, these are places where people are simply avoiding the diseases that foreshorten our lives. You know, everybody's going to die. These aren't, they're not people going to live to 120, but they're people who can live another 10 years without heart disease, diabetes, dementia, several kinds of cancers. And that's really the name of the game in both the world of non infectious and infectious disease. From chocolate to apple seeds, there's a wide variety of human food items that we know we should steer clear of when feeding our dog a balanced diet. But what about broccoli, for example? Is broccoli safe? The short answer is yes. Your dog can absolutely enjoy broccoli in all forms, raw and cooked. You'll just need to be careful not to add any extra seasonings or oils to the pan when you prepare it, as your dog's stomach might not be able to digest those as easily. Knowing what is and isn't safe for your dog can be really tricky, which is why I trust the team at Wild Earth Dog Food. Their high protein kibble is free from animals, and my dog, Jade, is absolutely loving and thriving on it. Try a bag today at wildearth.com and use the code PLANTSTRONG and save 40% off your first bag. So I, the, I think the reason food is germane now is because people are 
lockdown. A lot of people are locked down. And, and um, you know, I, I, I figure that the average American lose about, loses about a half a dozen years of life expectancy by eating the standard American diet. And that's not because we're lazy or weak or stupid. It's because we, we marinate in this horrible food environment that uh, every time you go out to eat, it's, you know, it's meaty, cheesy, um, uh, fishy entrees or, or uh, processed foods, uh, high starchy carbs, uh, sweetie starchy carbs and fast foods and chips and sodas. And you can't get away from it. We're genetically hardwired to crave these things. Uh, we eat out on average 110 times a year. If if we could just relearn the art of cooking at this mm. at, at this point, we're stuck at home anyway. And if we learn the art of cooking, we could shave about 300 calories off of every meal. Those calories would have lower salt, lower saturated fat. Um, you know, of course, you and I are going to be promoting 100% plant based food and blue zones. You know, I, I've just finished this book, the Blue Zone Kitchen. Yeah. It was, it, it was a huge success too, so far. Yeah. I've been killing 12, it. 12 weeks on the New York Times bestseller, number one bestseller at the Wall Street uh, Journal. Or, yeah. Is that what it is? The Wall Street Journal um, bestseller list. <laughs> Who's can, uh, huge congrats that on that. <laughs> people, you know, Minnesotans aren't supposed to brag, but I will tell you that if you tell that to people, they're more apt to read it if it's been mm. a bestseller. But anyway. Um, so for that book, uh, photographer, National Geographic photographer, David McLean and I went back to all five blue zones and we met the, the old ladies who are really the keepers of these traditional uh, food traditions. And uh, with that, um, we uh, took a meta-analysis of what these people have been eating for the past hundred years and then watched old ladies actually take these simple peasant ingredients and make phenomenally delicious food and in all cases it's peasant food it's cheap and uh, there are there are five pillars of every longevity diet in the world uh, they're eating whole grains whole grains uh, corn uh, beans rice I'm sorry corn rice and um, wheat uh, greens sweet potatoes and um, uh, nuts, about a handful of nuts. And then the cornerstone of every longevity uh, diet in the world is beans. They're eating mm. um, about a cup of beans a day. But the genius comes in is they know how to combine them to make them taste uh, delicious. I, I argue the most important ingredient in any longevity diet in the world is taste. Mm. Because I could tell you that eating fermented tofu or bitter melon, you know, might be the healthiest foods but if you don't like bitter melon or fermented tofu, you're not going to eat it for more than a couple of weeks or months. And then you're going to go back at, and um, uh, back to your old, old habits. So that's why it's so important, uh, you know, this time especially, find a half a dozen recipes that you like to cook, that your kitchen is set up to cook, your family will eat. Um, you can put them together quickly and put, make them part of your routine. And it's that routine, that's, that's setting up your surroundings for the long run that yields longevity. Not any short-term fix, not any supplement, not any pill or hormone or any of this other crap that marketers are trying to sell you. Yep. Forget all that. Learn how to cook beans. <laughs> <laughs> that's what you need to do a little long time. That's right. And they're super cheap. Yeah. So people in blue zones aren't exercising in the way we think of exercise, like they schedule it. Uh, but uh, uh, my team figures that every 20 minutes or so, they're nudged into some sort of physical activity. Um, they're gardening. They, every time they go to work or to a friend's house, it occasions a walk. Um, their houses are deconvenienced. So they're doing things by hand and not relying on some mechanized convenience to do all their work. A guy named Robert Butler, um, first director of the National Institutes on Aging, um, did this huge study looking at people's writing and how long they lived. And people who could articulate their sense of purpose were living about eight years longer than people were rudderless. And not coincidentally, I believe, in blue zones, there's, there's always vocabulary for purpose. There's a very clear understanding of why you wake up in the morning 
and none of this existential angst of what am I going to do today? So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, downshift. So the human condition is full of worry and hurry. All that triggers uh, uh, the inflammatory response, which contributes to every major age related disease. In all blue zones, they have some ritual uh, that that reverses that stress and that inflammation. So the Adventists pray, the uh, uh, Okinawans have ancestor veneration, the Ikarians and Costa Ricans uh, take naps, and the Sardinians do happy hour. <laughs> After the day, they're in, they're in the town square, uh, uh, or one of the bars, uh, having a glass of wine or two with their friends. But the point is, they don't just uh, hurl through the day and then, you know, in front of the TV at night, they're, they're, uh, they have, um, they have these sacred daily rituals that, that, um, help them slow down and, uh, lower the cortisol, lower the stress and, um, and, um, uh, yeah, get rid of the inflammation. Well, I, th and I think that if, if, if people are able to take this period right now with, with the coronavirus, and do some purposeful downshifting, I think it will help um, as... Uh, <laughs> you bring up a really good point, Rip, because, you know, from Gallup, and I think you know this data too, about 70% of Americans didn't like their job or don't like their job. And I feel bad for people who've lost their job, but a lot of the jobs they lost probably weren't jobs that were feeding their purpose. And for as difficult as it is for some of those people, this provides an opportunity to reboot yeah. and get a job that better lines up with their values and their passions and what they're good at and their gifts. And um, in, in that case, I have found that m most of the time uh, when a crisis presents itself, um, uh, given time, in, in, it, it, it morphs into a blessing. And, uh, you know, we, the, the news media fuels this sort of hysteria and tragedy and, you know, yeah, people are dying, but, you know, a tiny percentage of Americans are really affected by this. I think we ought to be reframing this. The earth is taking a breather. Yeah. The air is clean. The, you know, animals, the wild animals anyway, are, are not as beleaguered. The, uh, the uh, streets aren't full of traffic and cars. Um, we have time to reconnect with people electronically. Uh, I think it's a wonderful Blue Zones opportunity to find the blessing in this menace and, and, and reboot. Take Amen advantage. to that. Amen to that. <laughs> Next one, and it's a big one, 80% uh, rule, which is something that I do not follow. <laughs> yeah, but you, you swim every day. You, can, you, you, you got the calories to burn off or you burn off the calories. Um, yeah, so you know we're marketed the idea an, an additive construct when it comes to food. You know, omega three fatty acids, fiber, uh, your vitamins, your nutrients. It's you know we we we're subjected to more than ten billion dollars a year of advertising is reminding us that we need to eat something to be healthier. In blue zones, they have strategies to take calories away. And by the way, America got, America got obese at about 250 extra calories a day. And that's all. And um, Blue Zones people aren't eating those calories because they're eating a huge breakfast and medium-sized lunch and little or no dinner, eating all their calories in eight hours. They're eating with families, so they're eating slower, less likely to eat past the full point. Um, they're not eating, they're not, their kitchens aren't full of electronics, so when they eat, they just eat. They're not, you know, watching, they're eating to their favorite TV show, eating with their family and so forth. So and what, and yeah. specifically in the 80% rule comes from a 2,500 year old Confucian adage that in J J Japanese, uh, um, Japanese phrase for it is hara hachi bu, stop <laughs> when your stomach is 80% full. Yeah. I made it easier. And, and is that a principle that you follow? I follow it in the aggregate, yes. I, yeah, yes. 
I, you know, I, 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 I put a bowl of food in front of me and, and I put the leftovers away, you know, so I'm not tempted. And I don't mm-hmm. always follow it. You know, if I go out to eat with you and, <laughs> and John Mackey and McConaughey again, and there's a, a huge table full of delicious plant-based food, you know, I'm on the seafood diet. Uh, 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 uh. I eat seafood. Eat it. I see it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. Next. Um, next of the nine is plant slant. I, I know we kind of already talked about it, um, but I mean, if you had to put a percentage on these these five blue zones and what percent of their calories are coming from plants, would it be eighty five, ninety, ninety five? You have any idea? Are you guys in favor of plant-based diet around there? You know, Dan, man, we are plant strong. I can yes. see. We love the plants. So it varies. I mean, traditionally in, in the book, Blue Zone Solution, I published this meta-analysis. And if you look across the last hundred years in all five blue zones, it's about 90% plant-based. And they do eat meat, but it's always been a celebratory food on average five times per month. Uh, they eat no cow's dairy, interestingly. Mm. Uh, you know, they'll have chickens running around their yard, not the, you know, cruel, filthy uh, factory farms where we get our eggs, but, you know, it's chickens like a family member and uh, it gets fed and it gives up an egg. Um, and, um, and, and, and they will eat some cheese, a pecorino cheese, but not much. It's uh, always more of a condiment and uh, yeah, Okinawans de facto were almost vegan until about 1960. Uh, the, the Adventists, uh, the a portion of them are, are vegan, completely vegan. Um, but um, the, the big lesson here is uh, the, the more meat you, and cheese and fish you can cut out of your diet, the, the, the healthier you're, you're, you're going to be, the longer you're yeah. going to live. Yeah. Um... You mentioned the Seventh Day Adventists. Um, if I'm not mistaken, didn't you recently sell the Blue Zones to the Seventh Day Adventists? Is that correct? I sold it. To, yes, I sold it to the Adventist Health System. They run hospitals up and down the West Coast in the United States and and Hawaii. Um, uh, plant-based, uh, mission-driven organization, very much rooted in one of our Blue Zones, and uh, you know we. Uh, the last 10 years, my main job has been taking Blue Zones principles and applying them into entire cities. And we've been in 51 cities. Wow. And uh, it was it was bigger than than I could handle. And uh, the Adventists came along and they're very, very good operators. And um, they they said they'd, they'd um, um, you know, they offered me a, a, a nice um, buyout and, and said they'd, they'd take over the hard work, but I'm going to stay engaged and uh, be part of the team for at least five years here. Yeah. Well, that, I mean, so you, I mean, you've had the blue zones for a while and I can't, I can't imagine that that was an easy decision for you. Maybe it was um, cause that's, that's your baby and you want to make sure whoever you're kind of um, <clears throat> going to be working with or selling this to that they are mission aligned. And I can't, I mean, when I first heard, I was like, Oh my God, I can't think of a better, a better person that or a better organization that Dan could have sold this to than the seventh day Adventist. So I just think that's wonderful. Yeah, no, it's a totally positive. Total win, win, win. You know, at this point, it's more, you know what, here, here is the key DNA of Blue Zones. Blue Zones central tenet is if you want to get healthier, don't try to change your behaviors because you'll fail. Change your surroundings. Mm. And we got very good at working with city governments and schools, restaurants, grocery stores, workplaces, churches, and a critical mass of individuals to help shape the environment in entire cities so people were nudged into moving more, eating less, more whole plant-based foods, socializing in a healthy, productive way, and knowing and living your sense of purpose. That's what we did and we made it omnipresent, comprehensive, and and we put teams in place so we exerted this positive pressure for at least five years. That turned out to be a killer app because in every city we worked in, we saw the BMI or the obesity rate drop. We saw smoking go down. We saw diabetes rates go down, healthcare costs go down, and people's um, uh, reported uh, well-being go up. And um, we, you know, we have this healthcare system that is costing us 
three and a half trillion dollars a year. Nobody's figuring out, nobody's paying attention to how to keep that from happening in the first place. And blue zones kind of crack the code, but the effectiveness is a function of how well the plan is uh, mm. deployed. And um, the Adventists are just, they're, they're great at it. They know how to run really good hospitals and now they're just um, opening their um, aperture to take on entire cities. Yeah. Yeah. So we're, 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 I'm very, I'm very pleased. And by the way, this whole thing of I'm losing my baby, you know, I've had three other babies. I, I, I spent <laughs> eight years doing these incredible bike rides. I spent another seven years organizing these interactive expeditions called quests, which I sold to hardcore brace. And I did this. I'm a big believer that you should have several careers throughout your life and mm. try different things. And I am jazzed to, to go try something new now. And, wow. Uh, uh, I got, uh, yeah, I'm, and this is a perfect time to, to read and to think and to ideate. And, and uh, I, I'm excited about living. Oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, uh, do you have, you have any thoughts on what that next move is going to be? I think Netflix wants to do a series of documentaries on blue zones. And I have some innovative ideas on how to, how to uh, let an online audience or a digital audience participate in the production. And um, I'm also kind of interested in cities that have crashed, you know, like in the Rust Belt and come back. And there's a handful of them throughout America and even Europe. You know, we tend to be pretty America-centric in looking for answers. But if you open the aperture and you look at Europe and, and Asia and Latin America, for examples of how cities have collapsed and then come back, I'm interested in trying to find a, a um, universal r formula for rebooting cities that have undergone severe economic decline so those are a couple ideas i'm kicking around. yeah i like it well come to cleveland come to pittsburgh yeah uh we, we those places uh could use you what about wine at five <laughs> that's always people's favorite so people who drink a little bit actually have lower rates of mortality than people who don't drink at all so uh and we notice in blue zones all except some people among the adventists are drinking a couple glasses um you know, it's usually, it's usually red wine, a Cananao in, in uh, Sardinia um, or a sake in, in Okinawa, but they wind down with a couple glasses of something. So that's a, a blue zone tent. Uh, I, I, part of blue zones is making it to a hundred, but part of it is enjoying the journey. I would say a big part of it is enjoying the journey. Um, alcohol lowers cortisol. It, uh, it greases social gears. Uh, it, it, it just adds joy to life. And, and for Blue Zones, it's been a great way to attract uh, people who uh, just don't want another kind of scoldy uh, health yeah. program. They, it's, the, it's the fun part of what we do. And it, 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 you know, the other thing that kills Americans is loneliness. Mm. If you're lonely in this country, it could shave eight years off your life expectancy. And and uh, it's just easier to bring people together with a couple around a couple glasses of wine. So it's one of these, it's not a, it's, yes, it, it, the strictest view of that, of the alcohol in wine. Uh, yeah, maybe there's an argument, but if you open the aperture on wine and look at the whole picture, uh, it's definitely a blue zone um, uh, factor. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna have a beer next month. <laughs> Do you not drink at all, Rip? You, you know, uh, I would say I have maybe two or three beers a year. Usually, usually when I'm playing poker with my buddies. So the next, when this COVID thing lifts and I'm playing poker with my ten buddies, I'll I'll have a beer and I'll I'll toast you, Dan. Why don't you drink? Do you, because it's not not because you you're lowering your mortality by point oh oh one percent. No. You know what? It, it's, uh, it's a number of reasons. One is I've never really liked the taste of alcohol. Oh, never, okay. I've, never, I've never acquired a taste for it. The other is I, I, don't, I don't like drinking in front of my kids. I've got young kids. And I, so I want to set an example as far as just you know, not, not needing alcohol. Um, and then when I do drink, I, I typically, 
Um, so do you roll a joint and say, kids, don't drink? <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, I've never, I've never, I've never smoked pot <laughs> either. Uh, well, I will say those who don't, you know, we can see you on the screen, but those who've seen Rip personally, he's ripped. He's, <laughs> he lives up to his name. I mean, he's uh, probably the healthiest person. And you're 103, right, Rip? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, just a, just a little bit younger than you, Dan. Uh, all right, belong, belong. Yeah, th th this gets to this idea of uh, being socially connected, and um, it's uh, b belonging to the right tribe. So it's the idea of curating a group of four or five people who um, who are going to care about you on a bad day, and. Um, so I actually argue that's probably the most um, actionable thing you can do on the whole blue zone list of nine things. Um, there's no short-term fix to longevity, but if you're hanging out with people whose idea of uh, recreation is playing tennis or biking or swimming, you're more likely to do those activities. If you're, if you have uh, a couple friends who are vegan or vegetarian, when they come over to, your house or you go over to theirs, you're going to maybe be introduced to a plant-based way of living, which, you know, the one thing we violently agree on is that plant-based living is going to add good years to your life and reduce your chances. of. of um, so uh, most Americans, they don't even know a vegan. They don't even know a vegetarian. So <laughs> they go over to their friend's house and their baby back ribs and burgers on the grill and hot dogs and brats. And people don't realize that's like smoking cigarettes back in the 60s. So, you know, curating a couple of um, uh, plant-based eaters in your immediate circle. And then the, the key also is having a couple of people who care about you on a bad day. Yeah. Uh, that's it, probably the, the, the biggest stuff. Does that bleed right into then uh, the, the right tribe? Belong yeah. in the right tribe? Yes. Well, belonging to a faith is... Um, um, you know, ah. people in blue zones tend to belong to a faith. And when you belong to a faith, it, it often comes with a, a, a community around you. And yeah. that community is, tends to be healthier, tends to be caring, and um, obviously it tends to share your values. So, um, yeah, the whole idea behind blue zones is not another diet exercise program, but it's nine mutually supporting characteristics that help people stay doing the right things for long enough so they're not avoiding a disease. Yeah. The last one that we haven't talked about, loved ones first. Yes, that's um, investing in your family, keeping your aging parents nearby, something that's um, fallen out of favor here in the United States, conveys extra life expectancy to them, and um, Investing in your partner or your spouse. We know that married people live four to six years longer than unmarried people. And, uh, and then investing in your kids so that they take care of you when you get old. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's this very organic uh, way of looking at longevity. But it's, a lot of it's counterintuitive, but it, it, it's, it's about these uh, sort of whole life ways to stack the deck in favor of longevity. Well, yeah, and I can't think as I as I said earlier in this in this conversation, I can't think of a better time than right now for this country to em embrace uh, the principles of the blue zone of the blue zones. Um, we need it. We need it more than ever. Um, how speaking of uh, of partners, um, how is how is Kathy doing? Yes, Kathy Freston. She's writing another book. Um, Sixty one ways to uh, reasons to become vegan. And good sex is not one of them. Or, or just, <laughs> it's just one of them. <laughs> Got that one wrong. Uh, actually, I added that last piece. But she's doing great. She's here, here, here with me in, uh, yeah. in, uh, in, in Florida. And um, uh, feeling and looking as great as always. So. Well, will you please, please uh, let her know that when that book is coming out, I'd love to get her on the, uh, on the podcast. I'm sure she loves, she's writing it with your buddy, Gene Stone. Maybe you know that, but. Uh, uh -huh. I, I did actually know that. Yes. Yeah. She's so one Dan, of the great, one of the great innovators and one of the great leaders in, in uh, me. And I know you and your father are two uh, pioneers at 
uh, really introducing the idea of plant-based eating to Americans in a, in a big way. And, and uh, yeah, let me just say, I'm proud to be part of, uh, part of your circle. You, you pioneered long before me and your father before that. And it's, um, I think, one of the best things we can do for not only our health, but our country and, mm-hmm. and all the creatures that inhabit it. So uh, I salute you and uh, I consider it a great honor to be on this podcast, Rip. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Hey, Plant Strong Gang. We know there's been a monumental shift in our daily routines, and we're all cooking and eating nearly all of our meals at home, which can be a really cool thing. To help you plan, shop, and keep your kitchen running efficiently, I want to invite you to check out the Plant Strong Meal Planner with hundreds of recipes curated for your personal preferences and household. You can easily select the meals that you want for the weeks ahead and your grocery list will automatically populate. Pretty darn trick. Then, when it's time to cook, you can visit your menu and decide what to make. Our leftovers feature allows you to cook once and enjoy twice simply by automatically doubling your ingredients. If you're struggling with grocery shopping, we sync with Instacart, Amazon Fresh, and Peapod that saves you a trip to the store. And if you need help with substitutions, our friendly coaches are always on hand to answer any questions that you might have. Finally, my favorite feature of the meal planner is the ability to search by what you have in your pantry. So let's say, for example, you're down to a few cans of cannellini beans. You type that in the planner, and then it will instantly give you recipes that you can make on the spot. Right now, You can save $20 off the annual plan with the code HEALTHNOW, one word. Visit plantstrong.com today and click on the meal planner. Thank you, Dan, for your tireless mission to share these tenets, these pillars of longevity with the world. I hope that you've been moved to adopt as many of these as possible into your own lives and take the time to continue to find the silver linings, just like Dan. And as the fog starts to lift and we find our new normal, my hope for you is that your new normal will be one of health, peace, connections, and plants. For more details on the Power Nine, the Blue Zones Kitchen, and all of Dan's work, visit bluezones.com or our show notes in plantstrongpodcast.com. The Plant Strong Podcast team includes Lori Kordowich, Amy Mackey, Patrick Gavin, Wade Clark, and Carrie Barrett. I want to thank my parents, Dr. Caldwell B. Esselstyn Jr. and Ann Kryle Esselstyn for creating a legacy that will be carried on for generations and being willing to go against the current and trudge upstream to the causation. We are all better for it.